okay, probably I can start <coughs> with my introduction to uh, of the topic. The uh, in accordance with our course outline, we just finished talking about wildlife, about wild animals, and we touched upon such topics as uh, hunting. And uh, we discussed the uh, general wildlife use and special wildlife use. And we thought that sometimes as a result of hunting, the animals are not being killed, but are being captured and are being put in captivity. And logically from that topic of wildlife, of wild animals derives a new topic, which are animals used for entertainment, where we'll talk about zoos, cir uh, circuses, uh, uh, animals used for sports and so on, in, uh, uh, in which we'll see what actually happens with those animals once they are uh, put in captivity. Uh, is it really that bad? Or maybe in some circumstances, this is acceptable. Uh, Hello, professor. Which should be uh, the, uh, the conditions of, uh, in which this can be considered as, uh, as acceptable. So, uh, uh the uh, topic on animals used for entertainment will be started with our uh, guest lecture uh Ludmila Shigai, uh who will talk us uh, talk about um aquariums uh Ludmila is a, a graduate of uh, law school of Kyung University and uh, uh all, all the school is very proud of uh, of her of, of her success because she um, of, uh, took her LLM degree in Lewis and Clark Law School exactly in animal law. Uh, I will not mm, tell more uh, uh, about her. Uh, she will present herself better. Uh, so the floor is to, uh, uh, to Ludmila and uh, uh, she will tell you also about an etiquette of today's class, whether questions uh, should be asked at the end or, or during the class and, and in general, how the class will look like. Uh, from Um, hi, everybody. I'm so glad to speak here in this class today and so glad to see all of you, even virtually. First of all, I'd like to say thanks to everybody who registered for this class and expressed interest in learning more about animal law. Animal law is a new but developing field of law, and it's always good to see the expansion of the community. Let me tell you about myself. Um, as Maria mentioned, I graduated from QMAP School of Law in 2018, had little experience in corporate and criminal law in Kazakhstan, um, then graduated with LLM in animal law in 2020 from Lewis and Clark um, Law School in Oregon. Oops. Oops. Um, currently, I'm the managing director of the Institute of Animal Law of Asia, an educational research center that focuses on animal law issues in Asia and the world. We raise awareness about the threats that animals face every day, and our goal is to draw the public's attention to elevating animal status in the legal system, at least on a basic level. We do so by providing research projects on topic, on species, and on category animal law articles. We covered articles on animal law in 23 Asian countries. We also have new source and Asia Animal Law Bulletin and um, short projects. We also launched the Alliance for Animal Law of Asia, an international campaign that aims to cooperate with national, regional, and global organizations. Currently, we have 10 organizations that join the Alliance from South America, Asia, Europe, Africa, and North America. Recently, I spoke at the Animal Legal Defense Fund Law Academy webinar, where I presented my LLM thesis on the failure of international law to protect sharks. You can watch the recording at aldf.org slash webinars and scroll down to past webinars. I have also been awarded and selected as one of the ambassadors in the Global Ambassador Program launched by the Center for Animal Law Studies at Lewis and Clark Law School. Uh, in March, I will be one of the panelists of the Navigating the Regulatory Waters for Aquatic Animals at the Public Interest Environmental Law Conference and talk about how overfishing activities impact animals and the environment and touch upon international regulations. QMAP School of Law and the Institute of Animal Law of Asia are launching um, a voluntary free and open to the public animal law course where any individuals within the university will have an opportunity to learn more about the protection of animals, the animal law field itself, 
improve their writing and legal research skills under the supervision of Maria and the team of the Institute of Animal Law of Asia. On April 3rd, as a tribute to World Aquatic Animal Day launched by the Aquatic Animal Law Initiative last year, I'm also organizing the webinar within QMAP University with animal law experts who would share their knowledge about the importance of aquatic animals in our lives. Please follow QMAP School of Law and ILA social media to get more information. QMAP was a very joyful and significant stage of my life and in my law career, specifically because of Maria, so I'm happy to share my knowledge with you today. Today I'm going to talk about aquariums and the effect of keeping marine mammals in captivity. During my lecture, there will be a group discussion. Participation throughout the lecture is strongly encouraged and those who participated will be given one bonus point. You can ask your questions in the chat box and I can answer them at the end of my lecture. First, um, I have a question to you. What kinds of animals are kept in aquariums? Oh. <clears throat> Fish, fishes. Fish? Yes. Fish and um, mammals? Oh, could you please raise hands because um, I can't see you and... Yeah, um, I heard fish. Um, yeah, who else? Maybe mammals. Uh, what mammals? Uh, how is that? Uh, delphine, non dolphin. Okay. Um, yes, I did so. Yeah, go ahead. Um, um, yeah, I should say bulky. What do you Okay. Um, my next question is, what is the biggest fish on earth? Kid. I think it's uh, C, whale shark. I think it's blue. C, yes. Okay. Answer B. Ah. Okay. Um, who said whale shark? Could you please um, tell me your name? Because I... Uh, I th my name is Myra, and I think it's a uh, whale shark. Okay, why? Um, well, because uh, I I guess I've seen on TV show that the whale shark oh, shark, shark are the biggest sharks. So the shark is a fish. Mm -hmm. So that is why <laughs> out yeah. of uh, three yes, choices, I think it's uh, the right answer. Yeah, you're right. Um, the biggest fish on earth um, is um, the whale shark because whale shark is a species of sharks and sharks are fish. Um, now you can see the difference between fish and marine mammals. Um, marine mammals swim by moving their tail up and down. Fish have gills so they can breathe underwater. And um, marine mammals do not have gills. They have to come to the surface to breathe. Um, and marine mammals are warm-blooded animals and fish are cold-blooded animals. Marine mammals breathe um, air through the lungs and fish use gills to extract air from water. And also marine mammals are born alive and uh, fish uh, hatch from eggs. Uh, my next question to you is, could you please speak uh, out of this list? Uh, what, uh, what animals are fish and what are aquatic mammals? <clears throat> so, um... I think the uh, aquatic mammals are sea lion, then otter, um, polar bear, blue whale, orca, and dolphin. Okay. Um, anyone wants to list fish? I can again. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, it's a uh, manatee, salmon, a uh, whale shark, tuna, shark. Uh, that's all. Okay. Um, 
Great. Um, here's the list of fish. Um, yeah, it's salmon, tuna, shark, and whale shark. Um, and marine mammal, uh, aquatic mammals are um, orcas, dolphins, polar bears, manatees, sea lions, and otters. Oops. Um, animals used in entertainment is one of the widespread practices around the world. Animals are kept in circuses, zoos, aquariums. Um, oftentimes, a lot of species of aquatic animals are not drawing the public's attention, mostly because aquariums visitors see smiling dolphins and other animals happy. But not so many people know whether aquatic animals are well treated or whether they're actually happy in captivity. Animal rights activists have been raising awareness against aquariums for the same reasons they are against zoos. Fish have been proven by scientists to feel suffering and fear, not to mention that marine mammals are intelligent creatures and confinement destroys them and has a negative impact on their behavior and well-being. Um, marine mammals such as dolphins and whales usually live in groups and in tight family units that last many years sometimes even for a lifetime. Um, in their natural habitat, dolphins and whales travel long distances every day, swimming up to 100 miles, searching for food and socializing with other species. They also dive up to several hundred meters and stay underwater for half an hour or even more, spending only 10 to 20% of their time on the surface. Marine mammals' life in captivity is definitely not the same as in the wild. They cannot maintain family groups in tanks. Even if they're caught together, they're usually traded among different facilities. Because tanks are extremely small, they can do nothing except spending most of their time on the surface. Generally, large animals such as orcas and whales are kept in small tanks, which completely contradicts animals' natural behavior. As a result, animals get frustrated and express their unusual behavior. Um, also, the environment in the tanks is not marine. The water is filled with salt and other artificial additives. And finally, the process of catching aquatic animals itself has a huge impact <clears throat> on animals creating, <clears throat> excuse me, a stressful and injurious environment. It is difficult to monitor the population of dolphins kept in captivity, but in 2015, the report showed that the total number of dolphins in captivity around the world was estimated as 3,000 individuals. Uh, my question to you is, what do you think are the basic rights of animals? For example, if you were advocating for animals or if you were an animal, what do you think you, what do you, think, um, you should be entitled to? Okay, um, I'm gonna open the list of students. So let me ask um, Aida. Yeah, it's me. Um, basic rights of animals. I think people need to protect them and uh, build them special places that they be allowed to live. Like, I'm sorry, may I answer? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, um, I think that, for example, if we are obliged uh, to provide animals, mammal animals, like domestic animals, good conditions for living, so that means that we have to treat um, the, the like the fish and the habitats of the ocean and water uh, the same. We have to provide good conditions for living, uh, possibility to be fed uh, regularly, and that's the basic needs. Okay, um, great. Um, now I'm going to introduce you to, to the animal law movement, which has two sides, um, animal welfareism and animal abolitionism. Animal welfareism is the concept presenting that it is morally acceptable for humans to use non-human animals as long as they do not suffer. The use includes animals in entertainment, scientific research, slaughter, and others. Abolitionism is the concept providing that all sentient beings, humans or non-humans, share a basic right, the right not to be treated as the property of others. 
Abolitionists claim that animal products required treating animals as property are not necessary for human health in modern, modern times. The concept generally means that animals have the same right as humans do and should not be exploited by humans. Um, there is a concept of five freedoms um, which were designed for animals. Um, the first one is freedom from hunger and thirst by ready access to fresh water and diet to maintain health. This must be specific to the animal. For example, puppies, adult dogs, pregnant cats, and senior cats all need different types of food provided on different schedules. This is not always meant, for example, um, in aquariums because um, gelatin, which derives from the bones of cows, has to be fed to prevent dehydration and animals are, open, um, are often kept hungry for, um, for a long time and uh, their food rations can be used in training. Freedom from discomfort by providing an appropriate environment, including shelter and a comfortable resting area. This means uh, you should provide soft bedding in an area with the appropriate temperature, noise levels, and access to natural light. This is impossible to meet when the cetaceans are confined um, because they have no capacity to swim properly. And also there's often no escape from the sun and chemical burns. Freedom of, from pain, injury, or disease by prevention or rapid diagnosis uh, and treatment. This includes vaccinating animals, monitoring animals, physical health, treating any injuries, and providing appropriate medications. This can never be met in captivity. Dental disease is a common case, as well as wounds from attacks by other animals sharing the same tank. Freedom to express normal behavior by providing sufficient space, proper facilities, and a company of the animal's own kind. Animals need to be able to interact with or avoid others of their own kind as desired. They must be able to stretch every part of their body. This is also impossible to ensure because of the size of the tanks and the fact that cetaceans are unable to form their usual social groups. Freedom from fear and distress by ensuring conditions and treatment which avoid mental suffering. The mental health of an animal is just as important as their physical health, as psychological stress can quickly transition into physical illness. These conditions can be achieved by preventing overcrowding and providing sufficient enrichment and safe hiding spaces. And this is also impossible to meet in captive circumstances because it was proven that marine mammals in particular um, experience mental problems and suffering when captured. Now, um, I'm going to reflect these two concepts of welfareism and abolitionism on aquariums. From the animal rights perspective, keeping animals in captivity leads to the infringement of animals' rights to freedom, because obviously in the wild, animals live longer due to performing their natural behavior. Animal welfareists have the opinion that humans can use animals' rights as long as animals are treated well, and from that point of view, the issue with aquariums might be problematic. So from animal welfareism, it is acceptable to use animals for different purposes and keep animals in confinement if they're kept and raised in good conditions. Um, now I'm gonna ask you, what side do you tend to support? <clears throat> Um, actually, I think there is a lot of problems with, with the welfareism, as in most cases, uh, people do not provide the proper conditions to the animals, like uh, they saying that he, they can use animals as long as they treat them well, but still they do not meet conditions of uh, the good, how to say, the, the, of the good environment for the animals. So um, I think because of this, I will support the Abolitionism, yes. Okay, great. Um, my next question is, do you think our um, aquariums are beneficial or detrimental to animals? Okay, yes. let me ask, oh, yep, go ahead. Uh, I think they're detrimental, they're okay. not beneficial. Uh, 
can you explain your point of view? Why you think they're detrimental? Uh, as I said before, like uh, in most cases, uh, the people, the parents do not provide proper condition to the animals. And I think especially mammals, they need a lot of space to live happily. So the tanks, the space in the tanks is not enough for them. But as I as I remember, as I know, they're, uh, they tend to travel a lot, swim a lot in groups. So mm -hmm. I think it uh, goes against their nature. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, you're right. Um, there is a lot of min misconceptions and about aquariums. For example, mm, a lot of marine parks say that they conduct useful research into cetaceans. But in reality, there is minimal <clears throat> research output from marine parks compared with academic institutions. Um, some also say that training is enjoyable for animals because it involves positive reinforcement. Uh, but positive reinforcement means that after performing a desirable behavior or trick, the animals are given a fish to increase the chances of them doing it again. But animals have to work for their food and this method of training does not reflect the true desire to enact that behavior. Also, some say that captive cetaceans are ambassadors for their species and that facilities are educational and they create awareness and encourage ocean conservation, but uh, misinformation is reported as facts and those shows do not create awareness of the real issues. <clears throat> so why is confinement detrimental? Um, aquatic animals are separated from their families. Orcas, for instance, spend their entire life with their families while dolphins live in family pots in the wild. Large nets are used to catch aquatic animals and when caught, unwanted animals are thrown back to the water. Hundreds of dolphins are cruelly captured in Japan for aquariums or meat every year. Animals are suffering in captivity. Life in captivity causes animals mental stress, but also leads to physical damage to animals. Additives that are used in the water of tanks contain the um, chlorine and copper sulfate that can cause dolphins to go blind. A lot of marine mammals in captivity also suffer from peptic ulcers that are caused by the consequences of mental health damage and lead to the death of animals. There is plenty of evidence suggesting that dolphins show symptoms of being depressed in captivity. Dolphins can range from motions, uh, repetitive motions or unnatural behaviors that are only seen in captive individuals. Captivity businesses are known to give cetaceans drug that treat depression in humans. In aquariums where dolphins are forced to perform circus style shows, trainers often, often stand on the backs and even the faces of dolphins using their bodies as surfboards to entertain crowds. These shows are performed so often that dolphins begin to develop open source on their bodies. As the skin of dolphins is extremely sensitive, these wounds likely cause dolphins constant pain. Dolphins and orcas sometimes chew the gates to their tanks, uh, so often they break down their teeth. It has been proven that dolphins have sophisticated cognitive and emotional abilities and long memories. This also means that dolphins and whales captured from, wi from the wild who remain in tanks to this day are likely haunted with memories of the life and families they've lost. A great example is the telecom whale who was captured near Iceland and being a two-year-old orca, he was separated from his family in the ocean. He was living in Canada, a park where he had to face attacks from two dominant female orcas. In the park, he was forced to perform eight times a day, every hour, seven days a week. As a result of the mental stress and physical exhaustion, he got stomach ulcers. Upon the closure of the park at the end of the day, telecom was placed with incompatible orcas in a small round metal sided tank for more than 14 hours until the park reopened in the morning. One of the trainers of the park fell into the pool and was pulled to the bottom by Tilikum. His behavior was explained by the stress and frustration inside the tank. Tilikum was seen to have a collapsed dorsal fin, which was a sign of an unhealthy and stressed orca, and only a few orcas in the wild have collapsed fins. Later on, another aggressive behavior was observed towards humans. One of them was breaking bonds of the trainer's body before drowning. 
After that, Tilikum was placed in a tiny enclosure where his nose and tail were able to touch the sides of the tank and where he, he did not have the capacity to swim and communicate with other orcas. He was floating in the water, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, for hours. Such behavior is never observed in wild orcas. Tilikum's performance was resumed, but without close contact with humans. In 2016, his health worsened and he was considered to have a lung infection due to bacterial pneumonia, which, uh, which is a common reason for the death of captive whales and dolphins. In 2017, SeaWorld announced Tilikum's death due to bacterial infection. Unfortunately, the Tilikum is not the only whale who suffered in captivity and performed unusual behavior to distress and maltreatment. Aquariums continue operating their businesses and using animals to entertain people without even knowing how much damage they cause to animals. Lolita, another killer whale at only four years old, was torn away from her family and ocean home during the largest capture of wild orcas in history. <clears throat> In 1970, more than 90 orcas were forcefully put in nets and seven were sold to marine parks. Lolita was purchased, purchased by the Miami Aquarium where she has been confined for decades and used for human entertainment. She is the only survivor of that horrifying capture and spent almost all her life in the smallest and oldest orca tank in the world. The one that doesn't even meet the Federal Animal Welfare Act standards and fails to provide her with any shelter from the blistering Miami sun. The tank confining Lolita is just 20 feet at its deepest point, which is the same length as her body. With no opportunity to engage meaningfully in the most basic and natural orca behavior, Lolita spends her days floating. She has been without the companionship of any member of her own species since 1980 when her tankmate Hugo died after repeatedly wrapping, uh, ramming his head into the tank wall. Lolita's family, the southern resident orca population, is now endangered mostly because their babies have been captured and held in captivity and adults have been killed while trying to save them. There is a documentary about Tilikum's life and the consequences of ke keeping marine mammals in captivity. Um, I will Time, so um, I will guess um, I'll briefly mention the United States, and um, I was going to cover Kazakhstan and regulations too, but um, you can research it by yourself. So, um, in the United States, um, on the federal level, the Animal Welfare Act covers warm blooded animals in aquariums, for example, marine mammals and penguins, but exempts fish and invertebrates. Another federal legal instrument is the Marine Mammal Protection Act that protects whales, dolphins, seals, sea lions, sea otters, polar bears, and etc. But the act doesn't prohibit keeping those animals in captivity. Um, the act also provides the definition of the marine mammal and establishes the moratorium on taking and importing marine mammals and marine mammal products. Um, it also provides the penalties. Um, the Endangered Species Act was enacted to provide a program for the conservation of such endangered species and threatened species. The act applies to all categories of animals, including marine mammals, fish, and invertebrates, as well as those endangered species that might be kept in aquariums and other types of captivity. Uh, in Kazakhstan, there is there are some provisions in the environmental code, and there are also some decrees. And unfortunately, they uh, the violations of any of these provisions are covered only by the administrative code. Um, currently, a lot of countries recognize that dolphins, orcas, and cetaceans do not belong in tanks. For example, Canada, Chile, Costa Rica, and Croatia have banned the practice of keeping cetaceans in captivity. In 2013, India's Ministry of Environment and Forests banned the practice of keeping dolphins um, captive for public entertainment. Other countries such as Brazil, um, Luxembourg, Nicaragua, and Norway have highly restrictive standards that make it almost impossible to keep cetaceans in captivity. The last dolphinarium in the UK closed more than 20 years ago. Animals are sentient beings, and it is important to remember that the European Union, for example, in its Treaty of Lisbon, um, recognizes the animal sentience. Fish, crabs, shrimp have been proven to feel pain 
Dolphins are one of the smartest animals and they're capable of complex problem solving and social interactions. Octopuses have a section of their brain devoted to learning. Octopuses brilliant problem solving abilities have been documented time and time again. Like humans, orcas develop complicated social networks based on family ties. They also pass knowledge down from older generations to younger ones. Um, tool use has been recognized in a number of animals, including primates, birds, and cetaceans. And the recent research indicated that not only sea otters use tools, uh, but they may have evolved the ability to do so long before other species. Keeping such extremely intelligent animals in captivity and, and a natural environment is cruel. I know it might be tempting for a lot of people to go there or to take kids to the zoo or aquariums to show these beautiful animals, but most people are just not aware of the truth behind aquariums. And so education is important in um, all its ways. Thank you.